Welcome to Radius Church Online. We are so glad that you have decided to join us again as we're still in the middle of this shutdown and this pandemic. And I have a handful of Dream Teamers that are with us today. Come on, Dream Teamers. Can you say hello to everybody? All right. Well, I want you to know a few things. First of all, I'm going to introduce one of our overseers and a great friend of our church. Most of you have met uh, Pastor Corey before. He's going to be speaking today. Right before he comes, I want to share with you a couple of things. First of all, if you're watching at RadiusChurch.tv, uh, we encourage you just to go right over there to the Connect tab and fill out the connection card. And with the connection card, there's a prayer request. And we've noticed over the last couple of weeks, the prayer requests have dropped off a little bit. And I just want to remind you, we want to partner with you in prayer. And just because we're physically distant doesn't mean that we're spiritually or emotionally distant. So come on, I know the needs are great. We have a number of people that are going through challenging times. So let us be prayer partners with you on the connection card. Also, it's really important right now to be connected because we're sending out weekly emails with things like message notes and updates and just different things that are going on. In fact, we're getting ready to start some Friday night live services. And if you want to be a part of that, you got to be connected. You got to get the email to find out how to do that. Also on the connection card, I already said, is prayer requests. And so take a minute. If you're on Facebook Live, just click over to RadiusChurch.tv. You can watch us there live too and fill out the connection card. I want to tell you one more thing. Next weekend, we're starting a brand new series entitled The Bone Collector. Ooh. Can everybody go, woo? Okay, The Bone Collector. I can't wait. We're, uh, we're building a series off of Ezekiel chapter number 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones. I just really think there's some parallels to what we're going through right now, and things look as though they're dead, but God has the ability to raise up a great army, and I hear a rattling sound. Come on now. And uh, so we're going to start the bone collector. I think it's the best thing that God's put on my heart really since this coronavirus has started, so I hope you'll tune into that. Well, as I've already said, today we have Pastor Corey Hardesty. And he's brought his wife with him. And this was already on the calendar before all of this started. And thank you for getting on an airplane and coming out here in the midst of this crazy Seattle airport that we have. And uh, I know you were prayed up for that. If you don't know it, Corey is one of our overseers. Our overseers are just people that check in on Patty and I, make sure we're healthy. They're friends of our church. And um, it's really, it's, it's kind of what we say, they're my pastors and Patty and I's pastors that just kind of check up with us. Corey has been a great sounding board for us throughout this season. And uh, I'm so glad that he was able to come on during this time. You're going to be blessed as you hear his message. For those of you that are here, come on, let's welcome Corey as he comes to the mic. Well, hey, it is so good to be here with you, Radius Church. You know, last time I was with you was back in December. And boy, has things changed in just a few months. But uh, just so honored to be a part of just uh, our time together today and Really excited to be here, and I said I have my, as Ken said earlier, introducing my, just my incredible wife of 37, or 27, almost said 37, we'll get to 37, but 27 years is here with me. Uh, we're excited, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so excited. I hope I get through this message today because we just married off our third and final child a couple weeks ago. Three weddings in two years we have done. And we are officially empty nesters, so uh, we're excited to be here in Washington State with you all, and just what an incredible, incredible church you guys are. I do just want to honor Ken and Patty um, just because of watching uh, him and his wife lead through the challenging times that we are all facing right now. It is just amazing. You all have not just a good leader, you have a great leader. You know, there's good leaders that can do some good things, and uh, they think about what's good to do, and, uh, but you guys have a great leader, because he will not settle for second best. He won't just settle for the norm. 
He's constantly on the phone, calling, um, talking to people, trying to figure out how can we continue to make a difference through Radius Church and touch people's lives in the midst of this. And I think what's been beautiful to watch from a distance for me and watching in, just tuning in and watching your services uh, is just seeing that, just seeing the creativity in all the different ways that he's brought messages online. Because this is all new to us. It's new to me. It's new to, to Ken, just trying to figure out how do we talk to cameras rather than talking to rooms full of people. And as pastors, we like that. We like the interaction. And so he has just done, he and his wife done an amazing job. And I know you all honor them, but I just want to honor them and just, uh, again, on can, what credible, credible pastors they are. And it really is an honor to be an overseer of Radius Church. It's, it's easy to be one because they're such great leaders, and, and we love them so much, and, and love being here, love being around you all, um, not able to be around everybody physically, unfortunately, but so glad that we're here through technology, and that's a powerful thing. You know, one of the things that um, this whole pandemic has really, I think, brought to light for us is that the church doesn't exist for the four walls. You know, I think through all of this, though God, I don't believe God caused this pandemic. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Bible says that God uses, he turns all things together for his good. And what the enemy has stolen, he has to return. And so through this, if we allow, if we allow ourselves to listen and to lean in to what God would say to us, I think what we're seeing is the church is more mobilized than it's ever been. The church has come together as the big C church we have seen like never before. Just historically, there's never been any type of unity that we've seen across the nominational lines and all that through, uh, just through the, uh, uh, I just went totally blank, uh, 714. Um, um, what, what's the name of it? Unite. Help me. Unite, unite, unite 714. Um, We've just come together. I've been talking about that for months now. But it's just amazing to see what God is doing. And you as a local church, you know, Radius Church, are doing amazing things. Your generosity, because you all continue just to give as God speaks to you to give. As you continue to serve in whatever capacity you can serve. You know, it's more challenging to serve sometimes in these times. But there are opportunities to serve. People have needs that need to be met. And that's really what I want to talk to you today about how do, we, how do we make a difference in times like these? I don't know about you, but I've, I've sat sometimes at home trying to figure out, how do I do ministry? We're so used to ministering in buildings and with people. And now, not only can we be in buildings, but, you know, we're just distanced from people. You know, can't shake hands, can't hug. And... You know, the enemy would really try to get us discouraged and make us feel like we can't make a difference. But we all want to make a difference. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like before in your life that you're seeing that God is using other people to make a difference in people, but he's not using you? Have you ever heard stories of how God did a miracle or did something for somebody else, but Man, you would really love to see God use you to do something. And I just got a message. I feel like the Lord just wanted me to share with you today on just how can we make a difference in the days to come and the power that comes when we can make a difference. See, it's not as difficult as we think it is sometimes to be used by God. And one of the verses that I want to use, the stories I want to use, is one of my favorite miracles in Scripture, and it's in Acts chapter 3. And I'm going to read it to you, but it's, it's one of my favorite Scriptures because I think it illustrates a perfect example of what happened to two guys that went through a very challenging time in life, and coming out of that, how ministry totally changed for them and how they were used by God. You know, when I was young in ministry, I wanted to be used by God to do something, to help make a difference in people's lives. That's really why I got into ministry. I had a business background. My father was in business, and that's what I thought I would do. And ended up, my life was changed and radically transformed by a church just like this one that just 
taught me the truth about God's love for me and that his value for me and just changed my life. And so I wanted to make a difference in other people's lives like the difference was made in mine. But I struggled with how to do that. I struggled with how to, what does that look like? You hear these great stories, but how can God use me in these stories? And that's what I love about what God does for us is he shows us ways that we can be used. And one of the ways he did it was when I was young in ministry, I went to this funeral. Now, I had not done a funeral. I wasn't actually doing this one. I was going to watch it. My pastor that was taking me, I was just watching him. And it was a very difficult funeral. It was only a handful of people. And I'm sitting in the back and I'm watching this. And it was just very dark. It was just, man, it was, you know, funerals aren't places that are exciting anyway. But it was just really the, just the spirit in the room was just down and dark. And um, there's only a handful of people. And here this guy had lived his whole life. And I'm sitting there as a young man in my 20s. And I'm like, what would my funeral look like? When I have a moment like this, is there going to be a handful of people there? And not only that, that the people that were there, they were all fighting over what they were going to get out of the person laying in the box. And I'll never forget that moment. I left, I left that moment saying, God, I just want to make a difference. I want my life to matter. And I think that's the cry inside of every single one of us. I think God's put it inside of us to make a difference. We want to matter. We want to matter to others. We want to make a difference in other people's lives. And so how do we do that? Well, that's where I lead you to Acts chapter 3 if you're there, if you've got your Bibles out or you're on your tablet or your computer right there. I love this story about two disciples, Peter and John. And to set it up a little bit, in Acts chapter 3, uh, Jesus had been crucified. He was buried, rose again from the dead, visited with the disciples, and so they couldn't believe it. Their lives were just, uh, I mean, they were, they were scattered. They were actually in quarantine. They were in fear for their lives. They were hiding. And um, they come out of this, they have this encounter with God and the power of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, and then in Acts chapter 3, is one of my favorite miracles that happens. And it's, it says this, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now notice with me that this is something that's just common and normal to them. This isn't something that's out of the norm. This isn't some special prayer moment they're going to. This is something in routine that they have been doing for years and now they're going to the temple to do the same thing they've been doing, same time of day, three in the afternoon, to pray. Verse 2, it says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day. Say with me that word right there, every day. So this wasn't the first time this guy showed up at this temple gate. He had been there every day. This wasn't the first time that Peter and John had passed by this guy. He had been there every day. And so he's there every day. And what is he there doing? It goes on, it says, to beg from those going into the temple courts. So he's asking them for money, needing something. Verse 3, love this. When, Pe when he saw Peter, the man that was laying there, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Same thing he had asked everybody else that walked by. And then it says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said this, look at us. Which I think is interesting, because the man was asking him for them for money but the man wasn't looking at them. And Peter and John look at the man and asked him to look at him. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And of course, we all know what that expectation was. He was expecting some money. That's what he was needing. And Peter said to him, silver or gold I do not have, 
But what I do have, matter of fact, say that with me, what I do have. Because it's not what we don't have, it's what we do have that God uses. So Peter says to him, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. A miracle took place that day. A miracle took place that day through two people that God used as his hands and his feet. There's another verse where the Apostle Paul talks about a moment in his life as well, just like this, where the Apostle Paul was discouraged. He was defeated. He was, uh, they, he'd been through some difficult times. And in uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, he talks about, uh, verse 7, he, he talks about how God says here, but God who encourages those who are discouraged encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. And when I saw that, it resonated with this story. God is looking to use you and me as his hands and his feet. He has chosen to use people which he flows miracles through to get to them. And we can make a difference. You and I can make a difference today in this moment. I think if we do a couple things. I look at both of these stories, and you look at all the miracles. I was looking at all the different miracles of Scripture, and there was really two themes that I was seeing in all of those miracles. The people involved in the miracles were willing and available. Everybody wants to figure out, how do you do it? What's the secret? Is it how do you touch them? Is it what you say? Is it, is it how, you know, go bathe here? I mean, Jesus even spit in a guy's eyes. I mean, everybody's trying to figure out, how, did, how do you do a miracle? How do you get a miracle? Let's find a miracle. Let's, I want to see a miracle. And yet what we see in Scripture is that God does it in all different ways because he's using people as his hands and his feet. And he's using what they have, not what they don't have. And just like Peter and John here, they had gone by this man several times. They had seen him. This one, the first encounter that they had probably heard this man because they had seen him. They had seen him before, but they had just passed by. This time, they allowed God to use them. They were willing to stop and available. But I don't know about you, there seems to be, I, I want to be willing and available, but there's obstacles that I tend to run into. One of those obstacles I want to give you today, and there may be others that you may have, but I'm going to give you three today, three obstacles I was thinking about this that just, you know, are challenging sometimes to us. The first obstacle that I face when I want to be used by God or you want to make a difference or you want to do good in people's lives is fear. Is Fear. It always seems like you have an idea or something you want to do. And then isn't it true someone either comes along with a negative thought or trying to bring fear and why you can't do that or how that will never happen. Or maybe you don't have anybody talking to you. It's just voices that come to you in your mind and just your self-talk that starts convincing you like there's no way. Like what if this happens or that happens or this happens? It's kind of the way I'm wired in my personality type. You know, I'm a big disc test person. I knew that one. Now the Enneagram is out. And we've been studying that one, and I found out I'm a six. So on the Enneagram, if you don't know what that means, um, for me, it's already, I, I worry about everything. They said that sixes just need to be praised for having the courage to go throughout the day. Because <laughs> we don't have just one voice in our head. We have a committee. There's six or seven up there giving you all the different scenarios that could happen, and you're figuring it out. Now, sixes are the glue, they call us. They call us the glue. We keep everybody together because the other numbers may be freaking out or not doing anything, and we're the glue because we thought through every scenario, and we're going to bring the safety and the security there. But fear is a big one for me. And anytime God has called me to do something, to step out beyond just the natural of what I was comfortable with, man, I had to face fear. I had to overcome fear, fear of the unknown. Fear of failure was a big one for me. So I love to please people. That's the way I was wired. I was always afraid to fail. Had this fear of failure, not realizing that failure really isn't an option. It's really an asset to us. 
When we learn from mistakes and doing things, man, that's the beautiful thing about God is when we make a mistake or we don't get it right the first time, he's a God of second chances. He's there to pick us up and he wants to use us. We're learning as long as we learn from it. God isn't looking for us to be perfect. He just wants us perfected. He wants us in a journey of allowing him to work in us. And maybe this is the second fear you may have. I have fear, or fear is one of the obstacles. Maybe this is the second obstacle that you may have faced. And for me, it's this, it's doubt. It's just doubt. I start doubting myself. Doubting, you know, I'm, I'm, man, I'm not gifted enough to do this. All these doubts about um, what I've done or what I haven't done. And just doubting our competency of doing something. Um, just doubting that will God really do it? Like, what if I did lay my hands on somebody and prayed for them to get sick? Or distantly, dis- let's, let's not lay our hands on them now, right? But we just pray for them. <laughs> Thank God there's miracles in the Bible where they didn't even touch them. You know, they got healed. So he can do that. But we question, will that really work? What if it doesn't? And we start to doubt, and doubt will come in, and it's an obstacle. It's an obstacle to us to be willing and available. And then the third one is a, is a big one and, uh, for me, and that is busy. It's the word busy. So our lives get so filled with our stuff and doing what we want to do. And our lives, our family, our job, sometimes we're just too busy to be available. And it's an obstacle for us. And we have to make some adjustments. And I see with this in this very same story that happened with Peter and John. See, they were with Jesus. I mean, before this story happened in this miracle, God used them in this miracle. They had witnessed a lot of miracles and done some things with Jesus in the previous chapters. But they'd also walked through some challenges of fear and doubt and just being busy. Like I said earlier... I mean, you read the rest of that story of this miracle, and that man had been there. He was over 40 years old. So he had been there for years at that gate. They had walked past him for years asking for money or asking for... This wasn't the first encounter, but it was the first encounter. They weren't too busy to stop. They were willing and available for God to use them. And so how do we do it? What's the solution? This is the fun part because it's exciting. We see in the lives of these two guys, we can see it in our own lives and how God still works today. And that is that God, how we become successful in being used by God as his hands and his feet is we just do three things. And those three things are that we've got to, um, we've got to be broken. We've got to be broken as a person. Brokenness is what God uses. You know, Peter and John had been broken. Peter said he would never deny Jesus, ever. He looked at Jesus square in the eyes and said, I'll never betray you. I would never do that for you. I'll be alongside you all the way. And yet he did it, not just once, three times. He even said, I don't even know the man. Before this miracle, Peter had been broken. He realized that he needed a savior. He realized that, realized that in his enthusiasm and excitement to do something great, he couldn't do it in his own power and his own strength. He had to be broken. And I don't know about you, maybe that's where you are. Maybe through this pandemic and what you're walking through, maybe God's brought you to a place of brokenness. If you're there, I want to encourage you today. You couldn't be in a better spot. Because that's exactly what God uses, is broken people. I love what his word says to us in Psalm chapter 51, the psalmist David. He says this, he says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. When we realize that we need to decrease so God can increase in our lives, we realize the brokenness of our own humanity and that we need a Savior. 
And when we recognize that and realize that and ask Christ into our life, we are able to be willing and available and to be used. I think the second thing is just as powerful you see in this story. Not only was John and Peter and John broken before this miracle happened in their life, but another thing in their life happened, and that is that they were emptied. They were broken and then emptied. And that's the second thing we have to do. We have to be empty of ourselves. We fill our lives with so much stuff and fill our lives with everything that's focused around me, myself, and I. I know that was a struggle for me for years where I just, I, I always thought about the relationships, the friends I would have. Ever, when I was a little kid, even in school, I remember of times where I would pick a friend based on the toys that they had that I wanted to play with. It had nothing to do with the person. had everything to do with what they had. And I know you're laughing because you've done the same thing too. And we got to come to a place where we empty ourselves of ourself and all the stuff. And we allow God to fill the space. See, that's the process of God perfecting us is that he'll speak to us and he draws us to himself out of love. That's the brokenness. We make mistakes in our life. We do things where we find out that we are broken. We're not as good of a spouse as we thought we would be. We're not as good as a parent as we thought we should be. We're not as good of a friend as we wish we would have been or maybe an employee or an employer. And we get to that place in life and it breaks us. We realize when we're alone on ourselves, we realize, man, I need a savior. We're broken. But then God doesn't just leave us there. He draws us to himself, picks us up, loves us. The Bible says that it's his kindness that leads us to salvation. It's not his anger and his wrath. And I believe somebody's sitting there watching this right now. You're there. You may have never heard that. God loves you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. He is so for you that he wants to reach down into your brokenness and help bring healing there and use you to make a difference. But once you get broken, then you've got to be emptied of yourself. And not just be empty, you've got to be filled with Him. His presence. And we see that's what happened here to Peter and to John. You read in Acts chapter 2, won't take time to do it in this moment, but I encourage you to go read this whole story, Acts chapter 2 and 3. And you'll see that in Acts chapter 2, it says, they had an encounter and an experience where the Holy Spirit filled them. It was Acts chapter 2, verse 4. It said, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were praying and seeking God, and they became filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what God wants to do. When we receive Christ into our life, realize our brokenness, He then fills us, if we'll empty ourselves and let Him, He'll fill us with His Spirit, rather than just our spirit. That again, he may increase, we've got to decrease. And then the third thing that helps us become people that can be used, that how we can be made uh, able to make a difference, is that is being available. We just have to be available. God's not looking for perfect people. We saw that. He's looking for brokenness in our lives. He's not looking for people that are busy with everything they're doing. He's looking for them to empty themselves so that he can fill them. And when God fills you, he'll lead you to the people that need the miracle. And then he doesn't leave us there. He's just looking for us to be available. And I think this is one of the easiest ones, but it can also be very challenging. Again, because of what we talked about in some of those obstacles with being busy. That you just got to be available for God to use you. Because he'll use you in ways you never dreamed. He'll use you not inside the four walls of the church, but outside of it. That's what I love about all these miracles is they didn't happen in the temple. They happened on the way to the temple in people's lives. And so God will bring you. He'll use the platform at which he's given you to be his hands and his feet to make a difference. You just have to be broken. Realize that you need a savior. You've got to empty your, your life of your, just yourself and Be filled with God's spirit. And then you got to say, God, I'm available. Whatever you want to do, your way, not my way. 
Let your will be done, not my will be done. And you will see God use you in amazing ways. Now, I saw this firsthand when I was a youth pastor several years ago. My wife and I, we grew up in Colorado, Colorado Springs, where we grew up and loved to ski. And, and so I took tons of students on ski trips throughout all those years of learning how to ski and take them skiing. And my wife and I got called to go to Hattiesburg, Mississippi when we first got married. It's our first trip ever to the South. And God called us to a little church down there in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to be youth pastors. And so when we were down there, every spring break, we would do a ski trip for the students because I had family and friends back in Colorado Springs, and I could do a cheap ski trip for them because they would cook all the food for us, they would house us, and the students could go, we'd go up and go skiing. And I took hundreds and hundreds of students on ski trips to this local mountain. It's called Monarch. And the reason I'd always take them there is because I knew it like the back of my hand. If I lost a student or somebody couldn't be found, I knew the mountain like the back of my hand. And it was a small mountain. And when you're coming from Mississippi, kids don't care. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just any mountain is a great mountain when you're coming from the state of Mississippi. So we go to this little mountain, little small community town, Monarch. Well, one of those, one of the, probably, I think it was my last trip that I'd taken students on a ski trip, I had a situation that happened with one of my students. I was riding up the chairlift and uh, got to the top and had my name was on the chart. Now, you don't want your name on the chart because that means they need you in the medical center. Well, when you're a youth pastor, you have a group of people that you're taking. That's the last thing you want to see is your name because you're thinking like, okay, who broke their leg? Who's, what's happened now? So I go down there to find out what student, what's happened, how are they doing, are they okay? And when I get down there, they tell me I got to get to the hospital. One of my students had gotten in a very bad accident on the mountain and was being rushed to the hospital down in little Slidell, the little town there, the closest hospital that was there. So, of course, I jump in a vehicle. They run me down there. Now, I'm responsible for all these kids over 1,200 miles away from their families. And here's this precious little girl, about 16 years old, that's laying in this ER, emergency room, and she had had an accident where she had lost control and flew into the trees and had all kinds of head contusions and injuries. And not only that, but the thing that they were most worried about is that she had a tear in the aorta of her heart. And they took pictures of it. Uh, x-rays of it, and they could see this little tear that was starting to happen, a contusion, they called it, on the aorta, on her aorta, her heart. <clears throat> and they were so worried about it because if it fully ruptured, there was no way to get enough blood into her body. She would bleed out. So they were putting all these needles in her arms everywhere. And I'm right there in the ER with them. It's crazy. I'm holding stuff. It's like... Uh, it, it just, they were trying to just, it was 911. I'd never been in a moment like this. And they couldn't do anything. The heart surgeon that was there couldn't do anything. He didn't have the equipment. So we had to do flight for life to Denver. Well, all the helicopters were taken on other injuries at other resorts. So they were trying to find a helicopter to get us there. They ended up getting us on a Lear jet that came in. And now I will say that was a bonus on, on the trip was that ride on that Lear jet. I'd never been on one before. I hated that my student didn't get to, uh, didn't get to enjoy it because they were unconscious the whole time. But it was, it was amazing to get to Denver in like 20 minutes. But we're flying there. And I'll never forget where they're just saying, if this ruptures, sir, we just don't know what we can do. It's a life and death situation. So I immediately let my team know, my best friend who was with me at the time helping lead the trip, he'd come over and he took my kids that were on the mountain. They got together. They started praying. And I'm with this girl in the hospital in Denver, calling and talking to her parents. And I'm holding her hand, and I'm just praying for her. Now, I can't heal her. I ain't got the power to do it. But what I do have the power to do, what I did have, is I had my faith. And I had God's word. And I just began to speak life over her and speak life to her and We got family and friends to all start praying and praying over her. And we are getting ready to go into the surgical room there in the Denver hospital there. And they said, let's take one more scan before we go in and open her her up to repair this torn aorta in her heart. 
And when they came back to us, they couldn't explain it. They had the x-rays from Salida, the hospital there that shows the tear in the aorta. And now they have the x-rays, another set that they've taken, and it's just a bruise. There's no tear anymore. It's totally gone. They couldn't explain it. And I say that, that it just encouraged me and filled me with faith that day. That God used me and all the people in our church that were praying and interceding for that person brought him a miracle. Made a difference in a life. All because we were willing to do it and available to be there. And I know God wants to use you in that same way too. If you'll just be willing and available. Maybe you're sitting there today and you're listening to this and you've never... You've never made that decision to put God first in your life. Maybe you're sitting there today and you realize that you're broken, like you need a Savior. Well, I want to just lead you and encourage you. I want to lead you in just a simple prayer that right where you are, in one moment, you can receive the miracle of forgiveness and you can receive the wonderful gift of salvation. You have a God that loves you. I believe you know that. He's drawing you to himself right now. And I just encourage you, right where you are, if you're there and you need Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you want to be willing and you want to be available, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. Would you bow your head right where you are, close your eyes, and just pray a simple prayer like this. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me right where I am today. God, I thank you that you are for me. I thank you, God, for encouraging me through your word today. And I need you in my life. So I ask you to come into my life. I'm tired of living life the way I've been living it, leaving you out. And so I ask you to come and live inside of me. I believe today what Jesus did on the cross for my sins And for forgiveness for me, I receive that today. And I thank you for saving me. Now, Heavenly Father, help me. Put you first in everything that I do from this day forward. God, thank you for bringing my life into order. And on a journey, Lord, of being perfected. I want my life to make a difference. So use me. Now, Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person that's here today. I thank you, God, for everyone that's listening to this message. God, I thank you that in this moment and in this time, I thank you, God, that you're going to use people to be your hands and your feet if they'll simply just be willing and available to let you use them. God, we thank you that you are a God that does that. We don't know why you do it, but you chose to do it. And we thank you for it, that our lives can matter and that we can make a difference when we put you first in our life. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Oh man, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today at Radius Church. Encourage you just to tune in next week. Another great message coming to you next week. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Be safe.